Well, as I said, we've been uh, look, looking at last days, uh, prophecy, predictive prophecy. Almost 30% of the Bible is predictive prophecy, prophecy like no other holy book in the world. Everything that it has said and prophesied has come to pass so far. Never not been wrong at all, especially regarding Jesus' first advent. The prophecies about him were, were uh, just spot on. And it, it, I was listening um, to some verses this morning in the Gospels, and, and the, the critics of Jesus uh, were saying, you can't be Messiah, he's supposed to be from Bethlehem. <laughs> it's like, um, yeah, that's, that's where I was born. I, you know, I, I know I didn't grow up there, but you know, it's, it's just, you know, so many things like that, they just caught themselves, uh, painted themselves in a corner with trying to, to find him not to be the Messiah. But either way, um, so we've been looking at, at prophecy, and uh, speaking of times that we're in now and how much there is today. Uh, the first week we looked at just the, um, the last things, last times, how it'll be deception will be kind of a, the character, the culture, a lot of deception. And we see a lot of that now. Um, we see uh, that um, the last church we talked about, Laodicea, and I believe that we are in that age of the Laodicean church. Uh, the church that says, I'll tell you what, we'll come and we'll sit and listen to you preach, but we really want you to tickle our ears. We really want you to tell us what meets our need. Rather than teaching the full counsel of the Word of God, even the passages that are easily skipped over. And that's what we're doing today, actually. Uh, we're with, In this study of, of end times, we're looking at some passages that are easily just bypassed because it's important that we do. And we'll actually look at that today and why it's important that we look at them so again, we're looking at, at the past few weeks, looking at last days and things that were prophesied in Scripture because we don't want to be like the people that Jesus criticized in Matthew 16. It says this, Do you know how to discern the appearance of the sky but cannot discern the signs of the times? Jesus said to them. He's standing right, God in the flesh, standing right before them. And, and they, can, they can read the skies, you know, Red sky at morning, sailors take morning. Red sky at dawn, at night, sailors delight. That's right. <laughs> Y'all got it. So I needed help actually on that. But um, so, like I said, Jesus' first coming to earth was perfectly prophesied, yet they missed the signs. So many also didn't realize who he was. And today, you and I are not only seeing the signs of the times, I believe, and it's been said, we are living in the times of the signs. And we've seen so many things just line up with these last days. It's all written down, yet so many are unaware of the times. And I'm talking about even in the church, because it's either not taught or studied. So today, we're going to wrap up our last days series with the rapture of the church. And we touched on it briefly last week, but looking at it more in depth this week, a topic really that the world looks at and says, okay, that is totally bizarre. And even in the church, it's like, okay, we're just going to be gone? That seems really strange. And it is. It's supernatural. It's something that, that none of us have ever experienced. <laughs> at least I hope not. If you experience that, that would be strange. Um, so uh, we'll be looking at that uh, in, in more detail. So before we get into uh, that, and we'll specifically get into Thessalonians today, but I want to look at some things in, in Revelation. And <clears throat> when we studied Revelation, we said something that if you've listened to the study in Revelation, you heard me say this repeatedly, that there's a rumor going around that the book of Revelation is hard to understand. That's right. <laughs> But if it's, if it's the book of Revelation, you would think that if it was hard to understand, it would be called something like the consolation or, or the, the cryptic book or something like that. If it's the revelation, what does it reveal? Well, it's a revelation of Jesus Christ. In verse 1 of chapter 1, it says the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's not the revelations. It's a singular, the revelation of Jesus Christ himself and his plans and future predictive prophecy. And there were those, though, who would say, no, no, it's, it's, it's very hard to understand, and it's something you'll never understand. But if that were the case, why would he have said what he said in verse 3? Look at verse 3 of chapter 1 in Revelation. He says, blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. 
So it says there's a very special blessing. There's no other book in the Bible that comes with a very special blessing that says, you will be blessed if you hear these words and if you heed what they say. And so the Lord not only says, it's clearly what's going to be revealed, it's going to be revealed, it's laid out here. And also, it's, you're going to be blessed if you read and heed it. And not only that, the Lord said, there will be those who criticize and say that the book will be so confusing, so, so obscure, you really just need to just see it as allegorical and all that, that he, he said, I'm going to put an outline in it. And that's in chapter 1, verse 19. Verse 19 has an outline of Revelation. Write, therefore, the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which shall take place after these things, metatauta, after these things. And he says, okay, the things which you've seen, he sees Jesus. The things which are the seven churches of Asia, modern-day Turkey, from Ephesus to Philadelphia to Laodicea to Tarsus, and uh, not Tarsus, but uh, the, the churches there in modern-day Turkey in Revelation, that he, they were there at that time. That's chapters 2 and 3. And it also is a prophetic picture of church history. And if you've studied it, you see, and you can, if, if you look at the sequence of the seven churches, they line up perfectly with church history as it played out in time over 2,000 years. Could not have possibly been predicted unless there was a divine knowledge of this happening. If you reverse any of the order of one through seven, it becomes totally wrong. It doesn't make sense. It didn't happen that way in history. But if you keep them in the order that they're laid out in chapters 2 and 3, it makes perfect sense. So that's the church age. And then in chapter 4, verse 1, we see it says, After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking to me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one sitting on the throne. And he looks in chapters 4 and 5, and he sees the church, the 24 elders, the Jewish and Gentile church there before the throne, and it's a beautiful picture of us with him. Here's something very interesting. Before chapter 4, the church is mentioned 20 times. From chapter 4 to the end, the church is not mentioned at all, because they're not part of the story on the ground, they're in heaven. We're with the Lord at that point. And so... What, why, is that a, why is that good news? Well, if you look over at chapter 6, you see verse 16. And you see the wrath of God being poured out on the inhabitants of earth. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? There is an unbalanced teaching of the character of God in the world today. Oh, God's a God of love. God's God of love. You know, that Old Testament wrath stuff, you know, well, this is New Testament. This is future. And you think, well, how can God be a God of love and yet have wrath come on people like this? Well, go back in chapter 6 to verse 9, and you'll see who the wrath is coming down on. It says, and he broke the fifth seal and I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God, because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice, how long, O Lord, holy and true, wilt thou refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? That's the martyrs. That's those who were persecuted, slain, executed for their faith in Christ throughout time and especially during the tribulation period, we're going to see the wrath come down on those who've been waiting throughout time for vengeance. And you think, well, I still can't, I can't really reconcile that in my mind, in my heart, because God's so good. Okay, well, think about a parent. And that parent sees that child abused even to the extent of being executed. What does that parent want to do with that person who carried out that crime. It's the same heart, even greater, that our Father God has for his children. And the wrath that he's coming down on the world will be those who have done these kind of things to his children. So maybe that makes a little more sense in that context. <clears throat> so back to chapter 4. And we see 
after these things, I looked. And we're going to come back because, like I said, in chapter 4 and 5, we see the church in heaven. How did they get there? Well, that's the rapture. Some died before the rapture. Others at the time of the rapture. Hold your place in Revelation 4 and go to Luke 4. So the church goes up and wrath comes down. An interesting passage here in Luke 4. You'll recognize it, but we're going to give you some more information on what was said here when Jesus was speaking. In Luke 4, 16. As was his custom, he, Jesus, entered into the temple, the synagogue, on the Sabbath. He stood up to read, and the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And he opened up the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim the release to the captives. And recovery of sight to the blind, to free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, sat down. All eyes of the synagogue are fixed on Jesus. And he says to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now, the part that he's quoting there is from Isaiah, Isaiah 61. And Isaiah wrote the words 700 years before Jesus read the words in the synagogue that day. 700 years before Jesus were these words penned. But the religious leaders who were there know that he stopped short of some of the verse, some of the words that Isaiah had said in chapter 61 of Isaiah. This is what it says in Isaiah 61, 1 through 2. Listen. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. That's what we just read, right? But that's where he stopped because that's what he did in his first coming. And the first time he came, that's what he came for. It continues, the rest of verse 2 says, and the day of vengeance for our God. That's his second coming. Not the first. The Prince of Peace is also the God of perfect holiness. And no sin can exist in his presence. That's why we need Jesus. The wrath of God will come down on sin. If it weren't true, the cross would be not, not be necessary. The wrath of God is what was poured out on the Son of God on the cross. And each of us has a target on our heart that deserves the wrath of God. And Jesus stood in front of that wrath and took it so that we could live, so that we could go free, so that we could be born again. So he left that first part out when he was in the synagogue because wrath has to do with his second coming, not his first So back to Revelation in chapters 4 and 5, the church is in heaven. So the first coming of the Lord, when he brings us home, he doesn't come to us. He receives us to himself. That's when the Lord, if you're taking notes, you can write it down. That's when Jesus comes for his church. Jesus comes for his church at the rapture. All believers. That are on earth at the time. In John 14, this is uh, how Jesus put it when he was talking about the rapture. He said this Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and it says, And receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. 
And that's an idea, that's a picture of him bringing us to himself. I will receive you to myself. It doesn't say I'm going to come get you. It says I'm going to receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So that's a New Testament reference to the rapture. There's an Old Testament reference as well in Isaiah 26. It says, your dead will live. Their corpses will rise. You who lie in the dust, awake and shout for joy. For your dew is as the dew of the dawn. And the earth will give birth to the departed spirit. So it's not only those who are alive at the time, but those who need eternal bodies will be raised. It says, come, my people, enter your rooms and close your doors behind you. Hide for a little while until indignation. And the NIV there says, until wrath runs its course. For behold, the Lord is about to come out from his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. That's Isaiah 26, 19 through 21. It says, hide for a little while until indignation or wrath runs its course. Well, what is its course? It's seven years of tribulation. That's wrath running its course. He tells the believers, hide for a little while. You'll be safe away from the wrath while indignation runs its course. So the church goes up. What comes down? Wrath. The church goes up. Wrath comes down. And then in Revelation 6 through 18, after the, the, the time that we see that snapshot of heaven and the church there with the Lord. Revelation 6 through 18 is the seven-year tribulation. Really, really scary stuff. Cataclysmic upheaval throughout the world, executions, famine, plagues, people wanting to die and they can't. Longing for death, and yet the wrath of God doesn't allow that to happen. So the seven-year tribulation, Matthew 24 says this, for then shall be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, nor shall ever be. Unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. In other words, if God didn't stop it, no one would survive. In Revelation 13, it says that no one will be able to buy or to sell except the one who has the mark. Except the one who has the mark. There will be a one world currency. We're already seeing, and we have seen for years, the beginnings of that. We don't know what that will look like. We're st it's starting to take shape. It's almost like the prophecies of Revelation are now casting a shadow onto our current events, isn't it? We're seeing things happen, and we're thinking, hey, you know what? That sounds really familiar. In fact, if you look at Revelation 13, 17, I'm going to read it to you again. This is from the New American Standard. No one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has the mark. And when we talked about this, the literal word there for, for mark is something that goes beneath the skin. And I'm not saying that, that, the, um, that the recent um, inoculation <laughs> was the mark of the beast. I'm not saying that. But it's interesting that there was worldwide um, acceptance of this, and it was mandatory in many places. People lost their jobs if they didn't take that mark, that uh, incision, right? And so, again, not saying that's the mark of the beast, but it's almost like there's a shadow being cast from these times that we're reading about onto current events. Maybe the world's being primed for the mark. Perhaps. Just conjecture. <laughs> well, we will see. Hopefully we won't see, right? But we're so close to these events that we're seeing the foreshadowings of that right before our eyes. So after the seven-year tribu tribulation will be the second coming. Now, whereas the rapture is Jesus coming for his church, for his bride, the second coming is Jesus coming back with his church, with his church to the earth. In 1 Thessalonians 3, it says the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Jesus has to come back for us in order for us to come back with him. 
We can't come back with him if we're not already with him. And there are many scriptures that show that we are with him at that time. So let's go back and let's look at the rapture. Before the rapture of the church, we talked about this too. We talked about birth pangs in our study here in the last few weeks. And in 2 Timothy 3, it says, but realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. Another word for difficult there is violent, terrible, and perilous. But persecution, which has been going on in different parts of the world since Jesus rose from the dead, will continue until the rapture. Persecution is not wrath. Persecution, persecution is the wrath of man. Tribulation is the wrath of God. And so, realize this, Timothy, Paul says to Timothy, that in the last days, difficult, violent, terrible, perilous times will come. We talked about the birth pangs. And the birth pangs of when a woman is in labor and she has a contraction and then says, okay, well, that, that seemed pretty real. And if it's a false labor, says, okay, well, that false alarm, because nothing happened after that. But then when it's the real thing, contraction happens and then it intensifies next time. And then the time between the second one and the third one is shorter. Usually it can be different between this than that between the first and the second, right? So they get more intense and they get more frequent as the contractions happen, as the birth gets closer and closer as a rule. Again, there's exceptions, but as a rule, that's usually how it goes. And so there's birth pangs. But the amazing thing that happens, and the Word talks about this too, is that after the baby's born, there is this tremendous joy and it's almost like the pain was forgotten, at least for the moment, because of the joy that's in that mama's heart to have that child. This is blessed hope that we think about and read about in our lives. That after the times of suffering and pain and whatever it may be are done, we have this amazing supernatural, indescribable joy to look forward to in the presence of God. Later, we're going to see that we're encouraged to comfort one another with these words. So the rapture, it will be instant and it will be worldwide. It will be immediate and worldwide. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 52, Paul speaking says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable. There are many trumpets that are mentioned in Revelation. There are trumpets that happen after this trumpet. And so some say, well, yeah, but that says the last trumpet. Well, I thought we were not going to be here. No, no. This is the last trumpet that you'll hear <laughs> on this side. There will be trumpets that you don't, don't want to be here for. Those are after we're out of here. So it's the last one that we will hear. That's called the trumpet of God. And we'll see that here in a moment as well. But it says there, we will not all sleep. That means there will be a last generation. There will be a generation that will be here at the rapture. We'll not all sleep, but we'll, we'll all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye because we need new bodies that can last for eternity, that will never break down, never feel pain. What a beautiful promise that is. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound, the dead in Christ will raise imperishable, and we shall be changed with completely brand new bodies. In Luke 17, says, I tell you, on that night, there will be two in one bed. Usually that's nighttime. We looked at this last week. One will be taken and the other left. There will be two women grinding at the same place. And in that culture, ancient Near Eastern culture, the grinding of the mill was done in the morning. That's morning. One will be taken and the other left. Two men will be in the field. That's daytime. 
One will be taken and the other left. So, as uh, that's in Luke 17. And as he was describing this event, they didn't quite understand that the earth was an orb, <laughs> that the earth was round. There might have been some flat earthers among, <laughs> among the crowd uh, at that time. And if, if you're a flat earther, I apologize. The earth is actually round. I'm only going to tell you the truth here on Sunday. <laughs> so um, so the, uh, they, they, at that, that description, though, says it'll be at different times of the day, but it'll be at the same time. That means it's dark on one side of the planet, light on the other, and everybody will be at the instant with the Lord who is in Christ. So it means it'll be a worldwide event. Open up to Thessalonians. And this is where we'll look here at what the Lord says about this. Oh, Thess uh, First Thessalonians, thank you. First Thessalonians 4. That helps to know which, which Thessalonians you're looking for. <laughs> yeah. First Thessalonians 4. Before we read, um, understand something about um, the Thessalonian church. The, the believers in Thessalonica had heard Paul teaching with them about what we're looking at today. The same exact themes we're looking at today, the rapture, perilous times coming and all this, the Lord coming for his bride. And they were very concerned. They were thinking that they were living in the tribulation. Because he had taught them these things, so they were very concerned because some of them had been persecuted. Some of them had been killed for their faith already in this very early, early church. They'd experienced some persecution. And so they said, Paul, is this the great tribulation? He said, no. And then he said this in verse 13. But we do not want you to be informed pardon me, uninformed brethren, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve, as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. In other words, since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, same word. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, Michael, and with the trumpet of God. Underline that. Remember I said I was going to show you the trumpet of God? That's the trumpet. That's the last trumpet that we'll hear, the trumpet of God. Not the trumpet of wrath but the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Verse 13, we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren. When the Lord wants us to know something, whether it be from him directly in the Gospels or through Paul or some others, he says, I want you to get this. And that's what he's saying here. I want to make sure you don't miss this. I don't want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep. That you may not grieve as, those, uh, as, as do the rest who have no hope. I've done funerals for believers and I've done funerals for unbelievers. Let me just say, it's much more difficult to do a funeral. And some, when a believer, like at, at the church, may ask me, hey, come do a funeral for a cousin or whatever. Were they a believer? Well, they weren't. That's tough. And I've done it, and I encourage those in the crowd, we can know that we will be with the Lord, you know, and just encourage them uh, as best as we can. But you can just sense in the crowd when there are unbelievers at a funeral, despair. There's no hope. There is such sadness. 
Now there's sadness at a funeral of a believer, but it's a very different kind of sadness. We're going to miss them. It seems like they're, they're, they should still be here. All those wonderful memories and times, but there's no there, but it's not hopeless. There's wonderful assurance, a blessed assurance that we're going to see them and that they are with the Lord, that they're seeing Jesus right now. What a difference. Well, that's, what Paul tells them, we don't want you to grieve like those who have no hope. We have hope beyond the grave. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, since we believe that, even so God will bring with him, we come back with him because we've already gone to be with him. Those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this way, this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together. So go to verse 17. Caught up. If you have not marked this already, uh, you can write down the word raptus. Raptus, that's the, the, the root word. It's where we get the word rapture. Critics say, well, the word rapture doesn't even appear in the Bible. How can you say rapture? It's a, that, well, it doesn't, but it does actually because it's the word harpazo. Harpazo, from which we get the word harpoon, when you harpoon a whale, uh, very quick action. It means to take by force. It means that right here in this verse, and it means that every other place in the Word of God in the New Testament. Harpazo, to take by force. So when the Bible was translated, in the Latin Vulgate, it was translated from the original languages into Latin, they took the word harpazo and they put the word raptus, and that's where we get the word rapture. That's where that word comes from. And so the Latin uh, caught up is raptus. Um, now that's the, you know, to, to catch up. I, I don't even know how to uh, I could probably try to pronounce it for you, but it, it might butcher it. Some of the mirror or something like that. But uh, you get the idea. So we'll be caught up together to, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And, and by the way, earlier I was speaking on verse 14. I got myself uh, confused. I wasn't talking about us coming back with uh, the Lord at that point. That was different. Um, but this is the time that we're caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. So again, we meet the Lord where? Does it say on the earth? It says in the air. So the second coming has, takes place on the earth. In this case, we meet the Lord in the air. Second coming and the rapture are distinct, very different events. So caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. Then we who are alive and remain, we caught up. And meet him there. We're here, and then we're not. When someone passes away, they close their eyes in this world and they open them in the next. It's as much, it's as fast as a blink, just like that. And that's the way the rapture will be. It's not going to be like, whoa, I don't know how to fly. It's not going to be like that. It's, it's going to be that you're here, then you're with him. Okay, caught up very quick. But then it says that last verse. Again, therefore, comfort one another with these words. Remember, he's writing to this um, very fledgling early church, first believers, to say, comfort one another with these, these words. This is how it's going to go down. This is from the Lord, not from me, says Paul. So comfort one another. So let me ask you, because there are those who say, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a post-tribber, and so I believe that, that we're going to go through the tribulation. Well, again, the tribulation is the wrath of God. God has not appointed us to wrath. Persecution is the wrath of man. We may see persecution on our shores. I don't know. But let me just ask you. If the Lord says, okay, here's the way it's going to go down. Um, you're going to go through the tribulation Love you, but you're going to go through the tribulation. There's going to be executions. You'll probably lose your head. You're going to starve. Some of you may starve to death, by the way. 
um, plagues, diseases, maybe all these at the same time. Maybe you're, you're disease-ridden and hungry, and then you lose your head. You really don't know. And, 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 but don't worry. It's only seven years. So if you can hang in there for seven years, you're good. And then I'm coming for you. Do you think he would say in verse 18, therefore comfort one another with these words? Well, I'm a mid-tribber. You know, I believe that it's at the mid, middle of the tribulation, three and a half years in, that at that point, you know, then the Lord's going to gonna come for us. Okay, so, so three and a half years of, of famine, pestilence, executions, worldwide cataclysmic upheaval. Love you. I'm coming for you. Just hang in there for three and a half years and I'll come get you. Does that sound comforting to you? I don't think that the Lord would have told Paul to tell the church at Thessalonica and to tell us throughout church history, therefore comfort one another with these words, unless we were not going to be here for that part. Amen. So church, comfort one another <laughs> with these words. Be encouraged that those who have gone before us, some are already seeing persecution here, whether it be a lost job or prison time or whatever. Um, we don't know what the persecution will look like. Again, the church overseas has already been persecuted, being persecuted now in different countries, especially those who are very intolerant of Christians. The Lord may tarry longer and we may see more persecutions, more lost jobs, more jail time or, or worse. But we need to comfort one another with the words because he is our very present help in time of trouble. You read some of the, the testimonies of those who've gone before us who have suffered persecution and some of the stories of God's faithfulness and his sometimes supernatural showing up to them and encouraging them and strengthening them. Um, and providing for them. There was a, a story, I can't remember her name, April, uh, Darlene, that was Darlene Dibler Rose. Uh, you can Google her story. Amazing. Uh, was that during world, one of the world wars? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't review, obviously, before I brought this, just came to my mind. Uh, but she was imprisoned um, for her faith, and uh, she was starving. And um, she was just praying, Lord, if I could just have, and bananas were prevalent where she was. And um, she said, if I could just have one banana, just one banana, just, just something to satisfy my thirst. And the next day, soon after, she looked up and there was a whole bundle of bananas <laughs> right there uh, that had been provided for her. And she didn't ask anybody for that except the Lord. And so, you know, and, and just her story is just amazing. But, uh, but check that out in other ways that God provided for her and, and others. Um, so that's what I have today. Be encouraged um, that the Lord is coming. It could be any moment. It could be tomorrow. It could be in 10 years. But I want you to remember one thing that we've talked about each week in this study, that the fig tree is already blossoms, blossomed. In 1948, and this is the 75th year of Israel becoming a nation. Never in world history has a nation been birthed as a nation, ceased to exist as a nation, became a nation again. And it was not a nation for 1,870 years, and now it's a nation again. And it's been 75 years, says Jesus said, that generation will not pass before the coming of the Son of Man. And so look up. Your redemption draws near. That's oh, Today's the day? Oh, Thank you. I didn't realize that. I did not remember that. Not, May 14th. That is, that's pretty cool. Let's all stand. May 14th, 1948. Here we are, 2023. Maybe it'll be today. Wouldn't that be cool? The Lord tarries because we all have friends, family, and he certainly still has more kids to bring into the family, right? God is adopting children every single day throughout the world. I do believe personally that there will be a worldwide great awakening before the rapture. I could be wrong. It's not scriptural. It's just something I feel like God's going to do before he takes us home. So we continue to pray. Come, Lord Jesus, but save as many as you can. <laughs>
He's waiting for the fullness of the Gentiles, right? That last Gentile needs to get saved so we can go home. Amen. Let's pray. And Lord, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your word. And God, we look forward to that moment that we see you face to face. What a beautiful moment and eternity that will be to be in your presence, to experience reality beyond what we know now. This is just a shadow of the reality of heaven with you and, and the new heaven and the new earth and the kingdom of God among us, the new Jerusalem. How awesome it will be. So God, I pray you would take these truths, plant them deep into our hearts, and we all would encourage each other with Maranatha. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Lord, I thank you for these, this fellowship of believers. I thank you for their love for you, their love for your word. I pray you bless each one of them until we meet again. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen.